So, hey, uh, back here with um, Zamari, he's uh, one half of the Dan Vault, and we're going to attempt to give you the top 10 Steely Dan songs. Very difficult list to make. Um, I'm sure you can agree. Yeah, very. Very, very difficult list. So these are just songs that, you know, um, mean a lot to us for whatever reasons, and why don't we just get right into it? So um, why don't you start? You start. <laughs> Damn, look okay. at Okay, so for wait, so are, are we doing ten to one or? Yeah, or, yeah, we're not we're not starting okay, with okay, that song. Okay, yeah. For number ten, and this, this was close to being something that I guess I could put as an honorable mention, but uh, for number ten, I put here at the Western World as my tenth favorite Steely Dan song. Wow. And of course, keep in mind, uh, I, I really like this song, but I think the top five are probably the real strong standouts for me. Yeah, I, I think it's beautiful how it just starts off with the lush piano and it just has these really, you know, weird, silly lyrics and stuff. Uh, it's, it's beautiful, especially when it goes into the uh, guitar solo and stuff, because it just starts off really slow and calm and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then it goes into that cool beat and it plays the guitar solo. And I didn't know if this would count as a song because, I mean, you know, it's kind of like a you know, outtake or whatever, because they released it on a, the Citizen album, I think. Mm -hmm. It was some type of like compilation album that they released it on. I think, but, uh, wasn't it on the, it was on the greatest hits, the 72 to 78, I, th I think it was on that one. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I don't know. But hey, yeah. either way, it was released on a compilation album, mm -hmm. so I didn't know if it would be counted, but I was like, yeah, I mean, it's pretty full and done. I mean, when you listen to it, it sounds like a Yeah, no, it, it definitely counts, yeah. I mean, it might have been an outtake in terms of, like, it wasn't on, you know, uh, what, Royal Scam? You said it was from Royal Scam Sessions before. Yeah, um, and it, yeah. it, re it reminds me of the Royal Scam title track, too. It, it kind of has a, at least from what I've gotten, like, the lyrical uh, content is kind of like a, you know, foreigner in a new world type of, mm -hmm. you know, situation. And it's, it's, it's really beautiful. It's, it's a lot less... Uh, understandable as a royal scam which has really explicit kind of lyrics but yeah for the lyrics on the song i for me even though i don't get all of them it, that's that's a part of why i like it it's just really weird and stuff and it just you know some of the words just sound perfect and you know in their different spots and stuff you know yeah it, it's, it's a really beautiful track and i i really like it but i wouldn't say this is like definitely one of my favorite songs there, there are probably a few other tracks i could you know swap out with this but it, it's still a beautiful song and i don't see a lot of love for it either so i mean how, how can you love it that much when there's a donald fagan band 06 version i mean that's just <laughs> it blows the original out of the water but yeah, um, here at the western world uh number 10. wow wow that's surprising it's a good song i i really I'm, I'm yeah, a, I'm I feel like a few of I feel like a few of my choices are gonna surprise you. Yeah, that that really surprised me. Yeah, I'm I'm afraid that you're gonna say a bunch of stuff, and I'm like, man, that could have definitely been on my top ten. This one was one of the ones my number ten that kind of moved in and out, but I had to put it on there. Number ten from Gaucho, My Rival. Such such mm -hmm. a great song. Um, organ part in the beginning kind of reminds me of the Feds. Um, da 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 da. Kind of has like this like mm -hmm. gliss thing organ and electric piano lead up to the guitar solo it kind of goes great together back and forth and they got this clean guitar ba -ba -ba and then you have the dirty the ba -da -da -da. it's just i don't know it's a really cool combination yeah that, that road slams too i mean man uh tight horns really love the the clusters those like major seconds like that that horn part in the middle ba -da -da, da -da -da. really nice anthony jackson on bass is a great bass part. Steve Kahn guitar solo. Um, I wrote kind of sounds like Walter playing. I think when I first heard it a while, long time ago, this was like at least a week ago. Uh, it was, it was, uh, for a second, I was like, what was that? Was that Walter? Like, I, I didn't, I didn't know. Um, uh, but no, it's, it's, it's simple, but it's like fits the mood perfectly. Mm -hmm. Um, hilarious lyrics. And then some of the possible theories, like, it's about like, a uh, newborn and like the husband is jealous of like his you know newborn mm -hmm. son getting all the attention or i i don't know the lyrics behind it yeah I, I think out of all the songs that's probably the most ambiguous for me yeah it just goes all over the place i used to think it was super like underrated and overlooked which i still think so but over the last few years i've been really seeing more people write about how much they like it like online like i wish Donald recognized that and would play it on like regular nights instead of just saving it for gaucho night. But uh funny, funky, it has like all the 
quirks of a, of a really good Steely Dan classic. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's number 10. Yeah, and I, re- I really like that Donald does that kind of silly voice, you know, like in, you know, like on a, what's it called, Monkey in Your Soul, where he has that really weird and drawn out and exaggerated voice. I, I really like that. They, they both kind of remind me of each other with the vocal performance. For my number nine, I've got Bodhisattva. I got to take it way back to when I first got into Steely Dan. So I grabbed a CD from my grandparents. They, they gave it to me and I put it in the CD player. And the first song that comes on is Bodhisattva. And I just remember it, it was just like such a spiritual experience, you know. I was just laying there and the guitar solos were just going off and it was almost like a kind of sensory overload, a, you know, euphoric kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I've, I've always loved it since then. I had to put it in my top nine, particularly because it's so good, but also because of just how, you know, uh, big, of a, big of a song it has been for me. You know, the fact that I started with it and I've loved it since then. It's got Denny Diaz doing that great bebop solo and stuff. And, and then it goes into Skunk's gritty kind of rock uh, take. And you would think it kind of, they would kind of clash with each other on, on one song, but it, you know, they, they're both really good where they lie. With, uh, Skunk doing it at the end and then Denny doing it like near the beginning. Yeah, I mean, it's a really rocking tune. It's, it's, it's great. It, it really is. Yeah, those earlier albums have those like really like, I almost said hardcore rock. It's not hardcore rock, but you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like compared to, to compared to the other albums, obviously it's, it's more rocking sound, especially when you hear the live recording. It's like, man, they really could go from Bodhisattva. Mm-hmm. And, with, and with the lyrics up there too, I know there's supposed to be some type of like a, a deal with, uh, I guess, Asian uh, religion, something. Um, I, I, I forgot what it was, but I saw something about you know what the lyrics are supposed to probably mean and what yeah. Donald and Walter were saying they mean but that 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 doesn't really you know capture me all that much because they only have a few lines in the song it's mainly the music for me the guitar solos and the beat and you know just the rhythm and everything yeah uh, yeah I, it was, I, I, it's a really uh I, it's had a really impactful you know solid uh place in my listening experience with Steely Dan yeah, I think the lyrics were supposed to be because, you know, kind of at that time, there were like more people getting involved with like Eastern culture here and stuff. I think the lyrics are kind of poking fun at like how Westerners kind of fetishize that, like, you know, Bodhisattva, like, you know, taking by the hand, like, I'll sell my house for you. I'll do this for you. And, and giving themselves up to this like Eastern culture, you know, which is like, that's kind of like what they were making fun of. Um, they weren't making fun of like the religions or cultures themselves, but people mm-hmm. like fetishizing. Uh, but it, it makes for a really interesting lyrics behind a, a single. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's a really good song. Yeah. My number nine um, uh, is Negative Girl from um, <laughs> Two Against yeah, Nature. I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah. Such a great, this was like one of the most annoying songs I've ever, like it, on that album when I first heard it, I was like, oh, the intro is kind of cool, but the chorus is just, it's really annoying but overall i mean the intro chords are some of the most like spacious mysterious really reminds me of like coolie baba in a sense um they just really kind of set the mood great bass playing by tom barney vibraphone solo by dave shank um great um really interesting yeah the guitars kind of like um, um outro solo I, I don't know yeah it's just it's it's a very different mood it's almost like i can't really compare it to any other steely dan song um kind of that light drumming in between some of the verses the drumming kind of reminded me of like all i guess you could say rain or something like that i don't know it's just very very kind of yeah, it kind of hits the like uh with the snare it kind of sounds like it's hitting the rim of it or whatever it's kind yeah, of like a yeah. you know, really snap feel yeah um and then one of the main things like that i i, I might have mentioned to you before is that like it was the only song i would say at the, when I first heard it at that point in my life, and I think probably still, where I've like, you know, some people will listen to a song and they'll be like, oh, these lyrics, that's so me, this is so me. Or they'll see a meme and be like, oh, this is so me. Like that, that yeah, I identify with this. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of songs about like breakup and whatnot, but just like the specific lyrics in this song, when I first heard it, it was like, wow. Like, yeah, I've definitely been in this person, in this person's shoes. Um, I've definitely like, yeah, like 
I, I can I I can see the relationship between this and like you know comparing it to someone I was with in the past. I was like, wow, that's like that comparison itself to make me like think about that was. I don't know. A song never really did that to me before. It was just like, oh, the lyrics are kind of nice, you know. So I mean, that mm-hmm. alone definitely like made me put it on the list because it had that effect. Uh, so yeah, I was like, wow, this is it's a really good song. Very underrated. Uh, do wish he would play it live, but you know, I think we know some of the reasons why he, he probably doesn't. Um, some of the theories, but uh, oh, but yeah, oh, it's, oh, it's a good oh, song. What's one of the theories? I think one of the ones was that it was about Libby Titus, so that's why he doesn't play it mm. live. Mm, that, yeah, but I, I, I don't know. Mm. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's such a great. I mean, imagine how it would have sounded at Sony Studios, so crisp and clean. Really would have mm. loved to have a live version. My number nine is also Negative Girl. I mean, my number eight is also is Negative Girl. Wow. <laughs> okay. I've never ex- experienced anything like that, like you said you have, but uh, it's a really atmospheric song and uh, it's, it's really beautiful, especially with the, uh, I guess, vibraphone or whatever, you know, the bells that you can kind of hear. And then that drum beat ex- especially was kind of hitting the rim of the snare, kind of bouncy, uh, snappy feel, if that makes sense. Yes, yeah, it's, it's really beautiful. The lyrics, you know, skins like milk, it's like she's never seen the sun. It's, it, it really yeah. sets a it really you know kind of a dark mood but you know great atmosphere it, it reminds me of gaucho to an extent mm-hmm. you know just drugs and uh, not necessarily a good time in the end but it sounds good um yeah I, th- I think i would say there's some of my favorite lyrics on two against nature and just you know the dan in general negative girl you know, yeah it's, it's really great okay my number eight uh, which for the longest time was in my top three, um, but uh, that was a while ago. My number eight is a uh, title track from The Royal Scam. It's The Royal Scam. Mm. It's one of the most sinister rock pop songs like I've, I've ever heard. And for all like, you know, the kind of metaphors and theories and their lyrics, like these are very straightforward. And I always kind of love that about Donald and Walter's Donald's and Walter's writing was like, you know, they could have like the, the fun kind of like my rival kind of like, you know, silly songs and whatnot. And, and, and like, Oh, I wonder what this is about, whatever. But this one is like, boom, it's, it's super serious. And um, yeah, I, I love that low scene, the piano, um, that kind of motif. But first part sounds minor and the second part kind of sounds major. It's like, it's like a weird kind of in between awesome trumpet part of Chuck Finley. Um, some of the best solos, I mean, they have, you know, some of the faster songs like um, Green Earrings or Your Gold Teeth, you know, they have these these great moments for solos. And this one, it's like, it's just a slow driving force, but like the solos, man, they're so good. And they really kind of weave in and out of like the, with the lyrics really well, like the whole um, By the Black and Wall, um, he, he thinks he's died and gone to heaven, you know, when he's like shooting mm-hmm. up or whatever, and the trumpet kind of goes, Ooh! like, it's, when I first heard that, um, it was like, wow, it's, it's just really powerful. Um, and so the contrast again, between like their, their like sillier songs and they're kind of like playful mood and attitude with this is just like, holy shit. Yeah. Great lead guitar, um, solo by Larry Carlton, dramatic build up, And I like how kind of like the dun, 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 is in the piano. And then like, they slowly start putting the horns behind it. And oh yeah. The, yeah. Fire kind of builds up and. There's like this instrumental like thing around like the 340 mark. Um, I forget what lyric was before it, but I think it's like, it sounds kind of like bugs or something. I don't know. It's like a weird like ticking like. Oh, I, I've always thought it sounded like some type of uh, uh, electricity or something. But okay. yeah, I, I, know what, I, know, I know what you mean. Like it, it does that and then it starts going back into the regular. You know, yeah, the song. yeah, yeah. It's when really I first weird, heard but... it, yeah. Yeah, when I first heard it, I was thinking like, is it like, is, I'm thinking like this dirty, like kind of grimy downtown, or like there's like roaches or something. I don't know. It's just so weird. I didn't, I didn't expect to have like some kind of weird sound effect in in the song, but I don't know. It's just really, really creative, um, and like a a great closer to to a a really good album. Um, I think it really captures like the you know the album cover and the whole feel and everything. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and it's, it's very real themes, 
relatable to a lot of people in a lot of senses and that's this is really powerful so yeah definitely needed to be in my top 10 the royal scam yeah i think that's probably one of the i guess i'd say one of the best album closers by the damn and just in general you know out of some of the albums that i really like uh you know it's really powerful definitely hits that like you said that low c and the you know the drums are going off and everything it's really uh final and grand but of course dark as well so yeah, i think it's a great closing number seven i have babylon sisters the opening of gaucho that sets the scene and mood for the whole entire album you know it's really seedy and kind of a snaky song that's always I like to think of it it kind of feels like a snake you know just really uh devious and slithering around uh, yeah but great lyrics you know really atmospheric about this guy you know just going around banging chicks and getting drunk and you know doing all kinds of dirty stuff it's it's a horrible thing to be doing but you know it, it sounds fun and it, it really feels good just listening to the song great opening roads part like that that's probably like if, if you're learning piano that's probably one of the first songs you need to learn is that opening part and that, that just every, every time you know you hear that part start you're like oh snap the song's coming on really great song sets the mood for the whole album and i think all the songs on a uh, gaucho as well kind of had have, have that similar tone you know just really dark and uh very atmospheric and cinematic uh, babylon sisters on my top ten. Yeah, it's really good. Definitely, definitely um, um, one of the best on Gaucho. My number seven uh, from Can't Buy Thrill, Only a Fool Would Say That. Mm. Yeah, my, my favorite track on that album. Uh, it took me a while to get into, um, but I mean, overall, it's like, it's got this great kind of Latin groove, um, really steady, shortest song. Yeah, the shortest song on Can't Buy a Thrill, but it's it's short and sweet. I think it's in C major, but it starts on like the two chord, like a, a D minor chord. So just kind of back and forth, da, 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 kind of back and forth between them both. When you think about it, it's really simple, but like, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's interesting how, how simple it actually is. Yeah, shortest in the album, but the lyrics really pack a punch, you know, um, do that nine to five, uh, drag yourself home half alive, screen the man with the dream. And I don't know if it's um, Donald ever made it clear that it was kind of like taking a jab at John Lennon's like imagine, you know, making fun of that. I, I don't know if that was ever confirmed or if that's just like a, a yeah, that's theory. The, that, that's the general consensus, though, even though I've never really like, you know, thought of the song in that way when I listen yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, if, if that is, whether it's just a theory or confirmed or whatever, I mean, that's it's interesting. Um, so great guitar solo by Skunk. Um, and of course, you know, Skunk's little... Thing at the very end um <laughs> yeah i wish i could remember uh exactly what it was in spanish but i basically translates to only a fool would say that yeah it's it's just such a beautiful little song and um you know i i definitely had to put it in my, my top 10. okay so number six i have don't take me alive probably like one of the biggest uh guitar songs and just songs in general for the dan great song uh really dark as a lot of their stuff is you know, mm -hmm. classic guitar solo and there, there's one section in the song uh i think i pointed it pointed it out to you a while ago but uh there's like something with the roads part where like uh but there's there's something like deep in the mix that really just adds to the lyric he says it says i hear my inside it's the mechanized hum of another world there's like a part in the roads that really just adds to the that whole verse and just really, you know, hits you and adds to the darkness of it. I guess it's this guy that's supposed to be on the run because he like killed his uh, dad in Oregon. Yeah. It's, in Oregon. It's <laughs> yeah. Or, or Oregon. Yeah. I, I wonder why Donald said it like that, actually. It's probably just it helps him with like, you know, singing that character. It, it gives it some extra kind of edge. And, or maybe that's just how he says it. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, you know, great tune on the Royal Scam. I'd say it's probably like my second favorite or third favorite. Definitely a top three tra track on the Royal Scam. It, it really differs from the, you know, it's, it's pretty similar to the general vibe of the Royal Scam, but it differs from the title track, you know, quite a bit. But it still has that, you know, darkness and just uh, biting nature. But yeah, you know, really great song, classic, all time classic. Of course, they hit you with the great guitar solo as always. 
Yeah. I, I think Steely Dan, they, it's just crazy how consistently great their guitar solos are. I mean, like, oh my God. By so many different guitarists, yeah. Exactly, and so many different styles, like on a Bodhisattva, for example, like I was mentioning, you know, Denny doing that kind of jazzy solo and skunk, you know, shredding it. Mm. it it's really crazy. You know, whenever I listen to a song by them, and it has a guitar solo, I'm just like, wow, how, how do they just pump out so much good, you know, uh, material? It's crazy. Don't Take Me Alive, one of my top favorites, uh, equally as much for the lyrics as uh, for the music. And I mean, uh, I, I think this is one that has uh, Bernard Purdy on it, I'm pretty sure. Either way, it's, it's some great stuff, amazing fills, and you know, it really adds to the grand nature of it. And yeah, great, great guitar. You know, just great song in general. Yeah, it'd be a pretty epic opener for a for a concert. Just that. <laughs> yeah, and the and the crowd's going crazy because they already know what song it is. Yeah, they say they better they better know what song it is. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if they open with Cousin Dupree. You just heard it. Bum bum. bum. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh it's Cringe Maker. Oh shit, they're playing Cringe Maker. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a joke for the really, the truest yeah. fans. My number six, your gold teeth. Um, great. Mm -hmm. I think of all like the kind of Latin. Is your gold teeth? No. Yeah. Your, your gold teeth, the first one on okay. Countdown to Ecstasy. So my number six. I think of all like the great kind of Latin grooves that they have for the drumming between like Do It Again, Only a Fool, Your Gold Teeth. Your Gold Teeth is definitely my favorite. It's it's such a solid groove. Really wish I could have heard them do it live as an opener in what, 2011, 2013. Um, longest in the album with great solos, great guitar solo by Danny Diaz. One of the best examples of Donald's keyboard soloing skills. It's really damn good solo. Lovely B theme in the bridge. It's just kind of very, not too different from like the grooving, you know, main, you know, part, but uh, just nice kind of contrast. Outro is really jamming with the keyboard, uh, the keyboard part. And the drums kind of really go for it. It's just, it's just one of those songs that's like great for solos. Probably like one of my favorites um, next to, you know, Royal Scam or like, I guess more upbeat, like Green Earrings or something else. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and it's one of the few Steely Dan songs, I think, where the protagonist is, like, somewhat good. Like, he's on to the woman. Like, you know, I, I, I see you... Because some of the theories are like, oh, like, The Killing Floor is a reference to, like, casinos and stuff like that. And, like, she's some kind of stripper or someone who's, like, you know, uh, trying to, like, fool men into doing this and basically, like, you know, being a gold digger. And the, the protagonist is like, oh, I'm on to you. Like, I, I know what you're doing. Um, so... Where mostly, you know, most of their songs have protagonists that are either like stupid or <laughs> druggies or like criminals or whatever. Not to say this guy is any of those things, but you know. So it's very interesting. Um, but yeah, it's uh, that's my number six, Your Gold Teeth. Yeah, super yeah, solid and, track. And disclaimer, it's not on my top ten, but just to add to the to your point about the keyboard solo, that is phenomenal. Oh my yeah. god. Yeah. That's definitely one of my favorite. Uh, you, you gotta learn that so one next. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to a while ago, but as you can see, I have stopped. But um, yeah, d definitely one of my favorite solos, period, by uh, the band. And it's it's crazy when I think of, you know, just to think of the fact that Donald did that. Because you don't see too much of him soloing on, uh, you know, other things. Just, so just to see him, you know, uh, yeah. put out that type of uh, skill on the keyboard is, is just amazing. It, yeah, really, really trying really to one-up uh, Jim Beard, yeah, playing playing that solo, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. to do really it live. Really. I expect Donald to do it verbatim, as it was on the album. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it really reminds you of how good of a, you know, keyboard player he is. Oh, yeah. Because he, he only does those sparse interludes at, you know, every odd show, which is, isn't much, but yeah, great keyboards. Okay, so number five, I've got the great you know, track everyone loves, classic Dr. Wu, number five. I mean, I can't really say much that hasn't been said already about it. Phenomenal sax part, very passionate and strong. It's uh, Phil Woods, yeah, Jeff Picaro on drums. I think he, he, the only song he doesn't play drums on, on Katie Light is uh, 
uh, any world I'm welcome to. But yeah, you know, ph phenomenal drums, drum fills, especially. I I've always loved uh, the drum fills on that track. And just on, you know, Steely Dan songs in general, they're always really, you know, rhythmic and you know, perfect. Um, but yeah, great sax, great drums, very great depressing lyrics. They really make you kind of sympathetic, at least me, sympathetic for, uh, I guess, this, uh, you know, drug addict or heroin user, whatever you want to interpret it as. Um, especially when he's like, uh, you know, uh, something about trying to get, sing this song you used to sing to me. You know, it's of course supposed to be the drugs. And it's like, oh man, that's such a really poetic way to put it. And I, I really like that. And I've never really gotten into, you know, po poetry as a thing on its own, as an art form on its own. But listening to Steely Dan, they make it so beautiful, especially with the music and arrangements and, you know, really gripping. And this is definitely a song that stands out to me mainly well, not mainly, but a great part of it, part of the reason it stands out is because of its lyrics. It is really strong and, uh, and emotional. It's similar to uh, Charlie Freak, for example, that, that's a really explicit but uh, depressing and gripping song. Definitely a top three on the album, I'd say, on, on Katie Live. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Great tune. I, I, I couldn't imagine putting it any lower than a number five, any lower than my top five. But yeah, great track, beautiful. It really, it really is. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it, it's it's a really good track. It's it's one of those Dan tracks that again, it just really hits you hard. And, and it never like, gets old either. It never no, gets old. it doesn't. No. Like every time I listen to it, and it gets to you know that sax part in the middle, and then especially that sax part and you know sax and drum part at the end, which kind of is reminiscent of Asia. It's just oh my god, phenomenal, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In terms of like just the emotional impact, it's like it's right up there with the Asia kind of outro. Exactly. It's like it, they're so close. My number five, which is also super, super um, powerful uh, in a similar way, uh, I'm sure you would agree, is uh, Your Gold Teeth 2, right after Your Gold Teeth 1. <laughs> this is number six. Yeah, 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 baby. Yeah. Yeah. It's like Godfather 1 and Godfather 2. Like they're they're both such good tracks very different from your gold teeth one in the best way i mean who knew that this like weird kind of instrumental thing that they thought of in like 73 or 74 for prince of logic you know this they could really make this you know into a, a damn good song it's super moving um one of the strongest introductions i'm sure you agree those oh, great man. chords uh driving tempo um breaks into it's one of the most beautiful melodies that they've, they've written really it starts in four four goes to six eight and the kind of the back and forth piano chords it changes on five so one two three four five saying one two three four five six and then when he starts singing it changes on four so one two four five six one two three four five six one two three four which i like when i first realized that after hearing it maybe once or twice when, when i first first heard it i was like that's just it's really simple, but it's like, it's just really, really well written. And it kind of goes with the vocal part, the, the rhythm of the vocal part as well. His guitar solo is killer. Uh, yeah, uh, I wrote, holy fuck. Um, <laughs> it's one, one of my favorite of his, really. Uh, it's one of the most moving. It, it, it really is. Kind of like some of the sax solos, like the one in um, uh, um, Dr. Wu and, of course, sax from Asia. Yeah, this guitar solo is... You know for guitars it's really really beautiful um and kind of like the guitar solo at third world man you know it seems to go by fast but it's actually the longest on key line at 412 yeah and then there's a whole bunch of theories about the lyrics being about like you know uh who are the strangers who passes the door who cover your actions go you and more like the session musicians that are coming into the studio and like donald and walter being super like oh man who are these people that are coming in you know here and like playing these amazing parts you know um cover your action and go you one more so they kind of do what you expect and they you can go above and beyond I, that's just one theory of course but it's like it's, it's really interesting um and very steely dan like a way to write about <laughs> this recording process in that light and then the whole throw out your gold teeth and see how they roll the answers they reveal life is unreal almost like go for it just completely just you know um take the chance take the risk and just do it 
you know, which again, you could apply to this whole session musician theory, but in general, just life, just like, ah, just go for it. And it's funny that you were like, uh, holy fuck, is that, <laughs> that reminds me of the, uh, the studio recording, you know, where it's them going over it in the studio. And yeah, that's, that's, the that, that's what I put in there. Oh, that's... <laughs> that was a reference. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Donald's really uh, relatable there. Yeah, for sure. I think it's probably one of my favorite, like, uh, outtake, you know, studio chatter clips. Because it's, it's so, you know, that, that's what go, that's what's going through everyone's head. Oh, when yeah. He does that solo. Number four, I've got a uh, Royal Scan. You know, amazing track. I, I, I think no one disagrees. And if you do, then you're just wrong, you know, objectively. Wow, um, yeah. Yeah, just re really grand and a bold final final track on the album. Uh, great drums, Bernard Purdy doing all those fills. You know, they're, they're really funky and thick and, you know, just slap up, really big. You can really feel them when you listen to, when you listen to the song with the headphones. Great stuff, great lyrics. Of course, they're really depressing. It, it's not like they're extremely ambiguous either. They're like a, a a, a beautiful mix of explicit but still kind of poetic and slightly ambiguous, which I really love. I think that's one of the best mixes of lyrics that they've done. You know, where it's, uh, <clears throat> it, it's poetic but just uh, just explicit enough to be uh, understood. You know, re really beautiful. And uh, yeah, great, great track. Definitely one of my favorites. I never thought I would be so into lyrics until I started listening to Steely Dan. Like, this is one of the songs out of several where the lyrics are a huge factor in my enjoyment. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, it's just, just great stuff and amazing stuff. It's, it, it's reasonably in my top four. Wow, wow. I, I had, I had, that was a surprise. I would say that's a bigger surprise than here at the Western world. I had, I had no oh, idea people really, really love it. That's an even bigger surprise. Well, I mean, because I didn't know people really loved the title track that much. I mean, it's great, but you know, there's, you know, I, I just I had no idea you put it in your top ten. So that's that's awesome. That's that that's really. I, I honestly expected you to go crazy that I had here at the Western World in the top ten, but I didn't know. I didn't think Royal Scam would be even crazier. Well, you know, because because you hear stuff about like Kid Charlemagne's, of course, great. You know, the goat, and then you hear stuff like about Don't Take Me Alive and Kids Vault Samira. People love. Green earrings is, you know, but but I almost never hear people really talking about title tracks. So the fact that you put it top, like that's great minds. Yeah, that's, just that's like good. just like Bodhisattva. That's another song that I listened to because on, on the day I first discovered Stewie Dan and stuff. Uh, well, that was a different day, but when I listened to that Bodhisattva and I was telling you that you know it was really euphoric and amazing, I went and listened to their whole discography for the first time. And I remember when I got to Royal Scam, it was just another really just wow, like mind and you know, uh, mind uh, opening and mind blowing experience. You know, just <laughs> amazing. Yeah, it, it hits you hard. Yeah, my number four, uh, you already had it on the list, Babylon Sisters, my number four, um, one of their best anti-hero songs. It's just a very clear downfall of a, of a guy <laughs> such an interesting opening to the album it might be one of the most interesting openings to, to their albums it's just uh, like you said very seedy very dark um but at the same time super smooth and slick as gaucho is you know so it's got that weird kind of like contrast there with the slickness of the music but kind of like the dirtiness of the lyrics and mm -hmm. um what makes you say the, the opening's interesting? Like, is it something like musically that's interesting? Yeah, musically, it? yeah. It's just it's 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 very slow, and it's it almost sounds like I wouldn't say it's boring, but like an opening of an album. Like, it's just compared to like Black Cow, which is like slow, but it's kind of cool and chill. And then of course, mm -hmm. Kid Charlemagne's very like in your face, moving, you know. And Black Friday's really going for. It. I mean, I can go down the list, you know. Um, Ricky Don't Lose Your Number is kind of slow, but it's charming. But Babylon is like, it almost seems like it's just, I don't know, it's like cinematic, but it's like, it's just taking you into this whole different world. And it's yeah. just, it doesn't have to be like a boom, steal the album, like a big opener. It's like kind of eases you in there, but um, 
it, yeah, it's just really mysterious, but it's yeah, uh, that's definitely why I say Gaucho, that whole album is kind of like a, a movie because you know, the way you're explaining it, it really is kind of like a movie, it's just, it really just sets an amazing atmosphere, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the lyrics, you know, the, uh, the keyboard part in the intro sounds kind of light and playful, and I wrote it reminds me of someone who's first starting a bad habit. Which I, I, you know, I guess it kind of does. The narrator kind of goes back and forth between like he's painting a picture of this romantic, beautiful, somewhat, you know, experience, but then like he's realizing who he's having it with and what he's kind of becoming. And the lyrics, like you know, um, tell me I'm the only one. How like the backup singers, you know, the Babylon sisters, like they're they're singing it and he's also singing it, but it's like you know they know that he's not the only one i mean but it's like it's it's weird it's 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 very very strange um trumpet solo kind of sounds like a call for help it, it really does uh but uh yeah, and I said it might be the smoothest song on the on the album, uh, next to maybe Gaucho, of course. But yeah, it's uh, it's it's such a good one. It it really is. You know, pro probably would never leave my top five. Yeah. Um. So, um, definitely my favorite on on Gaucho. And I, I really like that. Uh, when you were talking, I just thought about the line. Uh, you know, where they're like, "Here come the San Andreans again," yeah. and then Donald's like, "Bad news." I'm pretty sure, I, I think I looked it up at one point, apparently it's like when the sand and stuff is blowing and it's just a, a bunch of uh, wind and uh, gusts of wind. And I don't know, I just found that silly when Donald's like, bad news, because I, I can imagine <laughs> if there's a huge, like, kind of wind uh, storm or whatever, you know, it's, it's pretty uh, dangerous, or, you know, in the way. Mm -hmm. But yeah, great, great uh, pick. So for my uh, number three, your gold teeth too. Nice. Phenomenal track. And once again, I mean, of course, we're having a lot of songs that overlap, so. Which is good. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to have to say too much about it that you haven't already said. You know, phenomenal guitar solo. I mean, amazing. You know, just blown out of the water. I mean, Denny is just. I, I love Denny Dice. I mean, I, I really think he's underrated. Uh, and then uh, we've only heard, you know, his guitar solos within the context of Steely Dan. Mm -hmm. But still, just from those, they're amazing, you know, incomparable oh, yeah. technical skill and, you know, really good, you know, really tasty arrangements. But yeah, great solo. That's definitely what really carries the song. I'm not going to say that the rest of the song and the arrangement isn't good, but the solo is a huge part of the song. If it didn't have, if it didn't have the solo, it would uh, drop the song. I would say quite a bit. You know, great arrangement, like you were saying. I really like that opening part, which is like da da da, and you know, it's just really powerful and just those harsh uh, chords on the piano. I think yeah. it's uh, Michael O'Marion on the Bosendorfer uh, piano. But yeah, and then it goes into that smooth uh, da 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 through. You said uh, six eight, six mm -hmm. eight, right? Yeah. It, it, it's it's really smooth. Definitely, probably a defining jazz fusion song from them. That if you want to say Steely Dan's jazz fusion, that's a jazz fusion tune right there. But not not just fully jazz fusion, because like with the vocal delivery, it, it, the vocal melody is kind of like a I don't know, kind of folky, or kind of a country sounding. I've always thought definitely true, almost true jazz. I would say. Um, yeah, Jeff Beccaro's up there as well. Great drumming. And I really like that part after uh, Denny Solo where, you know, you just kind of hear him like doing some like, little drum thing. Like it's, I, I can't explain it, but it's some weird type of little rhythm thing. It, it's really highlighted on him and then it goes back into the song or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like... Yeah, it's, it's something it weird, but I always like that because it's, it's just it's just there, but it sounds good. But yeah, really uh, standout track. One of the other songs, as long as as well as a uh, Bodhisattva and uh, what's the other one, Royal Scam, that I heard on like the first day I was really getting into Steely Dan, and uh, it really stood out to me. But yeah, long time favorite. 
It's good. Yeah. Which is why we both put it on our list. <laughs> so, I mean, he's, he's got to do it live, man. He's just got to. Oh, man. <laughs> I've, I've, I've told you about this, but can you just imagine that being an opener? I mean, Jesus. Oh. One of the best. Yeah. That would be, be super good. Just, that, was, that would be spectacular. Um, so my number three is also from Katie Lyde, Bad Sneakers. My number mm, three. Wow. Um, be- beautiful song. It's so beautiful. Beautiful intro. Sets such a calm mood for, you know, someone kind of like them being homesick, you know, and um, um, well, the, the character. Yeah. And I said, like, kind of on the surface. I mean, they, they said it, of course. It's kind of about like Donald and Walter being homesick, you know, about New York City and, mm-hmm. and whatnot. Um and the whole like the modulation from like the A major part to the C major part, like that bad sneakers, like it just changes chords. I know like that really got me the first time. I was like, that's just really weird, but uh, it's it's just you know another kind of genius, you know, uh, part of their, their um, songwriting. It definitely, like you said about Denny, and like I said to you, you know, about Denny solo for your gold teeth too, Walter Becker solo on this, like it, mm. that really gets me, you know. Um, Especially now, it's like that. That really, that really hits me hard every time. There's just so much passion to it, and like you really like get so much out of like every single note. I, I don't know how to describe it. It's uh, it's it's so simple, but it's like I don't know. You can like really feel it, and it's like it's one of my favorite Silly Dan songs. That like it doesn't fade out, but it has like an actual like ending. I don't know. It's it's heartwarming in a way. It's it's hard to describe, but um, but yeah, it's it's just a nice it's a nice tune. Definitely my favorite on Katie Lied. And yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't really know what else to say about it. Just, yeah, it pro- probably will always at least be in my top five for sure. Mm. So, yeah. I, mean, I know, I know what to say that, that I, I find it really interesting that you put that so high up. Oh, yeah. yeah? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, you know, of course, uh, trashing the song. I love it, but uh, I don't know. I just didn't see that coming at all. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, it's it's good. I mean, it's I I, I love it. I really love it a lot. And I, yeah, and I it's, it's, yeah. I, I I didn't I think start really loving it until maybe like middle of last year or mi- well, sorry, twenty twenty three, middle of like twenty twenty one. And then of course you know when I saw them live in in um, in Pennsylvania and they played it, I was like, oh my god, and that was totally that was. I think that kind of also did it for me too just hearing it there i don't know it's 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 great i mean i'm, I'm not even from new york and it makes me feel like homesick <laughs> about it so it's like i don't know yeah it's it's such a such a beautiful song yeah i would say it's underrated but i think as you told me before that was like the big hit from katie live yeah, yeah it's from definitely a standout song. song you know for pina colada my friend everyone loves yeah. you know that line yeah so yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great track i don't know I'm just, I don't know, I just find it really surprising that you put that so high up. But uh, yeah, it's, 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 it, it, I'm fine with it. It's a great song. Move number two, I've got West of Hollywood from Two Against Nature. Wow. Okay. <laughs> you surprised they put Best Speaker so high? What's the, yeah. West of Hollywood's good. West of Hollywood's good. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew this was probably surprise you and definitely a lot of other people. I mean, yeah, th- this song, as I've said, you know, 50 million times throughout this video so far, phenomenal. I mean, oh my God, the lyrics, um, it's, it's supposed to be like about this kind of a breakup and just like the downfall of the guy and whatever, you know, and of course, after a breakup, you're really torn up and sad, but it's so poetic and uh, cryptic, but beautiful. Like, uh, what's the line? It's... Uh, it's like, look in my eyes. Can't you see the colors frozen? Well, the core is frozen. I mean, man. Oh, and it's uh, you can't ask me to access the dreams that I don't have, have now. I mean, I don't know. I just find that so beautiful and touching. Mm. Um, but yeah, great vocal delivery by Donald, especially on that section where it's like, I reached out, you reached out for my hand, and then I lunged across the room and. I almost got there, and they say that like a few more times. It's it's really powerful, and there's like some uh, chords on the piano that just hit in between those lines that really add to the punch of it. But yeah, man, it's, it's really like a punch to the gut. <clears throat> and then of course I can't 
you know, not talk about Chris Potter's infamous and fantastic solo that goes on for uh, like four and a half minutes or so. Yeah. And it, it's crazy because the whole time, in the beginning when I first listened to it, after a while I got kind of tired of the solo because, I mean, you're sitting there for four minutes listening to it. I mean, it's, it's jazz, so, you know, but still, it, originally I got tired of it. But now whenever, whenever I listen to it, it's just amazing. Like throughout the whole run, I'm just like, oh, you know, tensing up the whole time and it's, you know, really euphoric and passionate. And when I listen to that solo, it kind of makes me think of uh, just what the, what it feels like after a breakup. Cause you know, the solo is so chaotic and, you know, crazy and stuff. It, 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 it's really, you know, uh, gripping. It's, it's beautiful, amazing. It, it really ends, it really is interesting though, that there are no like a, guitar solos or really anything like that. I mean, it's kind of one in the middle. I think that's by Walter, but it's not really like a guitar solo, guitar solo. Yeah, I, that's funny you bring that up. I, I think Walter mentioned that, that they were, he was going to do something at the end, but then like- Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris is like, he was like, oh, let me take a shot at it. Or he like, he wanted to do it. So I don't know how many takes, you know, it took for Chris to, to do the full thing. Um, or like if he just, took it home for the night and then like looked over the music and thought of something I, I don't know but i guess it seemed like walter was going to do something and i'm in this case i'm really glad he didn't because <laughs> the sax <laughs> solo is like it's super i mean good. it probably would have been great but still but like as the as an ending to two against nature it's like it's out of nowhere it's just straight bebop for four minutes yeah, it just, it just leaves really you strong. sitting there like like wow what what, what album did i listen to yeah um, yeah no. yeah and, and, and i almost wish that they released it on Sony Studios because they have it in the raw recording for one of the nights, you know, him doing it. Oh, yeah, it. yeah. And it's really fucking good. <laughs> and then at the, at the end, they all kind of break. He's like, bruh, 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 all by himself. And then it has this really heavy, like, ending that's just like this minor chord. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I forget, like, totally different key. It's super powerful, man. Like, yeah, I, I, love, I, I, love, I love how they do that. Like, it was, uh, it feels like they're change it's like they're changing keys each time or whatever it's like boom, da, 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 da. it keeps you know going up and like coming back down and going yeah up. yeah it's, it's really I know weird and it's yeah. just really creative I, I, I love it but um yeah and then at the end there's like this kind of weird synth thing where it's like in your ears you know what i mean like yeah and then, the then it kind of goes out like some weird, yeah man it, it's just so, like, how how do you think of that? I mean, it's, it's amazing, you know. Donald and Walter are just brilliant. I mean, man, yeah. aliens from another planet, uh, but, man. But yeah, yeah, West of Hollywood. I never imagined I'd put a Two Against Nature track on my top three, or you know, two in this case. But it's it's rightfully deserved. Ugh. Yeah, crazy, crazy, nice. crazy track. Wow. it's good it's really good yeah um so my number two right number two yes um uh another song with a uh, great sax solo asia title track from asia Ooh. my number two this one it would be my number one um you know but except that it's not um and at the end of the day it's so hard to choose you know, some of these are so great but like it's just such a beautiful song overall it's like thinking of like what some yacht rock band can become you know what what can they do and like how far can they take the style and like all these different blends of different you know genres of music or whatever and to just come from this that has such high you know peaks of very different emotions and starts very very kind of calm and you know lyrics and up in the hill you know it's called kind of like dreamlike you know um, which unfortunately, and this is nothing to do with the with the song. It's not really anyone's fault. But like when you hear it live, it's really big and like it's explosive. And it's kind of like a version on uh, Northeast Corridor, you know. Um, you can't really capture that like kind of subtle, very, um, very, uh, you know, dreamlike kind of calm quality that the album, studio album, really captures, obviously. But um, but yeah, but I mean that compared to just the the brute force at the end it's just really really powerful um so i said listen with headphones yeah i said can't really put into words how it makes me feel listen with headphones and you'll see what i mean that's true um yeah one of the best songs i've ever heard really never a dull moment um instruments orchestrated so carefully 
to paint one big picture is just it's just really moving. And Danny and Walter, they play great solos, kind of complement each other. When I first heard it, I thought that that was one solo or was one player, because um, it sounds so similar. But um, both the solos are great. Wayne Shorter sax solo, it just it it hits you out of nowhere, and it's like not. I mean, it's not as long as the Chris Potter one, but uh, but it's like, <clears throat> but it's like it's really powerful. I think he did it in like what one take or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know, uh, one or two takes, but like I think they, they went with the first one. I believe. I don't remember what they said. I'm pretty sure it's uh, it was the first take or whatever. The um, first take, yeah. Apparently, he just went in there and just laid it all out, and then peace. yeah. And 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 I don't know how many takes it took Steve Gadd to do the drums, but the ending is just, it's hypnotic. And then when he gets to the, you know, the one rhythm, I I wish I could say what it was musically, but um, t- t- what at the end? Yeah, yeah, with the yeah, with the, with the ride and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's just you know going. It's it's so good. It's just the so many emotions in this one song. Such a great track. Um, hit so many highs and and lows. Of, just I, I don't know how to describe it really i mean that's why the first thing i put in the notes was i can't really put it to words how it makes me feel so but uh but yeah it's a it's a beautiful track and then you so. were saying uh i think it was last time we did this one of these videos you were saying uh about the uh kind of metaphor about you know asia the place but as well as uh as well as it being a woman or you know love interest in the well, yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, because they, they, they mentioned it on the, on the, you know, classic albums um, interviews that they had a friend who, mm. or, you know, was dating a girl named Asia. And they thought it was like, it's kind of, you know, great name, and, you know, this kind of quiet relationship with, with, with this beautiful woman. And like, you know, that's, I mean, that's basically what the song is about, but it's just, it's, yeah, it, it really, but there's just so much passion behind it, you know, um, even though they're not explicitly saying what's happening in the relationship or, you know, you know, when all my dime dancing goes through, you know, I run to you like what, but, <laughs> but they, they don't really need to. It's like the emotions all there. You just need to listen to it with headphones. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's such a great song. Um, I don't think it'll ever be out of my top three and really ever. So wow. yeah. You know, I already know I'm probably going to get, lynched or crucified by the dandum community but i have no asia song in my top 10 as you've seen so far but there, there there's no uh song from asia at my number one either right yeah. now we're on number one our number one steely dance song number one number one pick and okay before i get to the number one like we said in the last video and like i'll always say this isn't like definitive you know definitively you know officially my opinion um I mean, it's my opinion, but you know, right. it's not. There are several other dance songs I love. It's it's really hard to do this, so this is just you know, for fun to say, you know. Um, but yeah, number one, my number one dance song, almost gothic from Two Against Nature. <laughs> yeah, almost gothic. Beautiful. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's weird sitting here right now because I, I made this list. I finished it a few days ago, but I started with almost gothic, like I think a month ago. Mm. But like sitting here at this exact moment, I might put West of Hollywood, you know, on par with it, or maybe a tad bit higher. I don't know. And there's several other songs that I wanted to put on this list, but I was like, I don't, I don't know. It, it was really hard, you know. Like I said, I love all the songs, but. uh yeah, almost got it for it's it's always been my favorite off of uh um two against nature you know beautiful lyrics uh, almost gothic in a natural way yeah be- beautiful lyrics i guess this guy crushing on this girl who's a uh, really me- weird and mysterious or gothic if you want to say you know whatever you know it's almost, kind yeah. of ambiguous to an extent um but yeah a great trumpet solo by uh, michael leonard he's not doing that you know crazy stuff he does on stage it's really smooth and sensual yeah re- really be- beautiful and i like how before the solo donald's like uh i hear her rap and brother is strong and then if he does the uh michael does the trumpet solo it's almost kind of like her you know speaking or it's or it's supposed to be some type of like a, a characterization 
of, of what the girl is like. I don't know. It, it just really feels like that's supposed to be uh, an example of what the uh, woman's like or what it makes you feel. What the trumpet solo makes you feel is kind of like a, what the woman is like or, or what she's like in his head at least. But yeah, beautiful love song. It's really interesting how many love songs uh, that Dan has, especially with their kind of like, uh, we're smart and read books and we're sarcastic. You know, that, that's their kind of vibe. But they have tons of really beautiful, lush love songs, especially one like this that's so uh, uh, mesmerizing and passionate. But yeah, I, I remember when I first heard this track, I was like, wow, that's Donald singing? Because, you know, he's so... I'm working on gospel time, and he's, you know, he's so calm and smooth, and I was like, yeah. oh, hold up. But yeah, it, it's a be beautiful track, be a beautiful track. Um, I really don't, don't know what else to say about it. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's just a great one, definitely. But, but yeah, like I said earlier, though, at, at the time that I put it on the list, you know, started it at the top of my list, I felt really passionate about it. I still do, but just sitting here at this exact moment, I probably would put it like a number two or three, but yeah, it's still a top three. That's still big. It's, it's a beautiful song. Like like with several others, uh, the lyrics hold a lot of weight, just as much as the music. Maybe even a tiny bit, you know, more than a, than the music and arrangement. But either way, you know, beautiful track. Love it. Yeah, no, it's it's super good. I I really wish they played it more than just that one time live. It's such a great song. It, it is underrated. I mean, yeah, that was one of the first tracks. Uh, first, it was one of the tracks on uh, Two Against Nature when I first heard the album as a whole. I was like, almost oh, God, like, what, what the fuck is this? Like, it was just sounded, I don't say throwaway, but it was like, it, it, initially it sounded kind of boring. Like, it just didn't, you know, reel me in. <laughs> but uh, the payoff is one of the best, as, you know, the payoff is for Two Against Nature as a whole. Really good track. Yeah, super, super solid track. Um, yeah, and the uh, the lyrics are, you know, uh, really interesting, too. I really like uh, how he says, uh, it's something, something, I'm sizzling like an isotope. It's, it's really, like, weird, like, because the majority of, the, of people probably don't know what an isotope is. Uh, I mean, I know because I'm you know, still in school. You know, I've had science classes. But, uh, right. And I, I'm, not, I'm not saying, you know, the majority of people are dumb, but, like, what average person knows what an isotope is, but... Uh, so yeah, it's great to kind of, I guess, get that reference. And uh, yeah, it, it, there's there's lots of weird kind of lines and phrases yeah. throughout the song like that, that really and just that, make it unique. Uh huh. The opposite of an aerial view. I, yeah, I, like, I, like, <laughs> like what? Uh, <laughs> um. So yeah, no, it's great. That's mm -hmm. that's it's definitely. I think it, it is one of my favorite on Two Against Nature. Yeah, most Gothic. Um. And another line that I can think of off the top of my head is a uh, like a uh, pure science with the splash of black cat. Like it, it's it's really weird. Like <laughs> you know, where, where do you come up with that? You know, but I really like it. It adds a certain kind of a just hint of goodness to it, it just by making it so kind of a slightly odd and unique. But yeah, a beautiful song. It's great. Yeah, really good. Um, my go. number. This is, is going to be controversial. <laughs> uh, it it probably will be actually, in a way that people might not expect. Um, I actually told you this before several times. My number one, oh, Real in the Years, oh. Alive in America, the live version of Real in the Years. Yeah. My number one Steely Dan track, and it probably always will be. I mean, it, it wasn't oh. always, but at this point. It, I think it always will be. There's just, again, I wasn't, I wasn't born yet in 93. I didn't attend the concerts, you know, like whatever in the nineties, but there's just this timeless yet like this nostalgic feeling when I hear that. Um, I, I'm not really sure how to fully describe it, but um, you know, the sax melody in the intro instead of the guitar, I love the guitar solo. And, and you know, the first one, I, I think, I think it's really good. Um, I think it's classic. And I, I know, I know why really in the years, the original is like, Many people's, you know, one of their favorites of the dance songs, or I know why Donald plays it as an encore. Um, it's good. But this version is just with like the the kind of like the chords that they do in the beginning, how they kind of change it up subtly. Um, and they have like the sax, you know, kind of playing the beginning. I don't know how to describe it. It's just, it's so interesting how, you know, they came out to this live version. It's almost like 
if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, the first version was not broke, but it wasn't like they kind of fucked it up. They made it something that was like, to me, it like, it just, the feeling I get listened to, it just kind of surpasses the first one. I don't know. And again, not to put the first one down. It's great. It's a classic. As much as I've heard it a billion times, I do get kind of tired of it. It is a really good song. Uh, but this one, yeah, it's just, it's a uh, um, best piece of evidence to kind of showcase their live abilities, you know, live revamping, you know, um, um, skills with some of the songs that they change up for the live versions. Um, I love the, the new harmonization. It's got these major seconds kind of like in this extended chord thing and going back and forth. Um, one of the best, you know, live Walter Becker's, Becker solos, well, live, I don't know if he did it on the... Uh, he did it on the um, what you call it uh, in the studio, like an overdub or whatever. But I, I, I think it's he did this one live, and then a great Chris Potter sax solo. Uh, what Enius kind of plays this this guitar solo in the end. It's kind of like the icing on the cake, and it's kind of going in and out with you know Tom Barney playing the bass part and everything. And I don't know, it just it there's so much emotion in it. Um, almost kind of like it's just there's there's a lot of like liveliness in it, and then the whole kind of like tried tone with like. I don't know. Um, that wasn't a tritone, I'm just saying. But like that kind of like reharmonization is just when I first heard it, I was like, oh, that's so weird. But after a while, it's like it's a combination of just like some of the quirkiness with the musicality mixed with this like the timelessness and all the emotion. And it and, sounds and it it, sounds like they have some type of like uh, kind of dissonant chords going along with that too. It's like dun 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 dun. Yeah, when I yeah, listen to yeah. it, it sounds kind of like weird. Uh, yeah, no, but it's um, it, it oddly it, it blends really well with the outro. I don't, it's it's uh, and I think the fact that it is live adds so much more to it. I mean, you know, regardless of how much it might have done. And I'm really curious if people, if you saw this in the '90s, did you like it? Were you turned off by it? Were you like, what the fuck? This isn't real in the years. Like, I'm curious what people think because it's so different from the original that um, I can imagine being a, a fan of the '70s and then like, oh shit, they're touring again. And they play really years. You're like, what? That's not that. I mean, I can, I can, I can imagine. I can imagine, I can imagine yeah. when they played it, they were like, uh, when they started singing real in years and stuff, it was just like masses of people getting up and walking out. Right, right. <laughs> and, and and look, not that this really matters because this is, you know, it's, it's a ranking video for fun. But if you were to say, well, that's a live version, it's not actually a studio version, and we're ranking the studio songs, you know, then if I were to take it off the list for that reason and then bump everything up, so Asia was number one, everything up went one, then my number 10 would probably be Home at Last, which is why I thought of some honorable mention. That might be my my number 10. Great keyboard intro, great Walter solo, pretty shuffle. Uh, yeah, that'd be one of my honorable mentions. But but no, Reeling in the Years, live version, really good. That might be one of the only reasons, yeah, not the only, but one of the few reasons I keep coming back to Alive in America and would probably choose it over Northeast Corridor. Yeah, that and Book of Liars, of course. Um, and uh, and the green earrings on Alive in America. Oh, it's so good. That's it, my, my number one. I think that's always been a really interesting take of yours. The fact that you uh, think that that version of Reeling is your favorite, like, it, you know, your favorite song, dance song in particular. I mean, it's, it's a great arrangement. I really like it, but... Uh, <laughs> like, yeah. uh, Look, you, you, you making yours almost got the me making real in years from live America. People are gonna be like, "What? I'm gonna, I'm just logging yeah, off yeah. right now." I don't, I don't even think you should upload this video. Like, <laughs> a few hundred people are gonna unsubscribe for you. Uh, no, no. I mean, these are all, look, it's hard to choose. I mean, you know, I'm, yeah, everyone, right. anyone watching, I'm sorry we don't have Deacon Blues and My Old School. Yeah, on Deacon the list. Blues, Do It Again, My Old School, Top Ricky Don't Lose a Number, Black Friday. <laughs> and it's really interesting that uh, they even put Book of Liars on uh, Alive in America, being that it's a Walter, you know, solo song. Uh, I almost wish they would have put uh, a, a Calm Curiad track up there or something. That, that would be even yeah. more interesting. I, I don't think the uh, 11 tracks of Wax sales did very well, considering they were not touring for so long. And then on top of that, it was a comic here. You had Donald Fagan tour, even though it was, they were called yeah. Studio Dan. And Walter was yeah. not like a, a primary, not that he wasn't a main writer, but like, you know, he'd been out of the spotlight for so long. People, yeah, who, he was. Yeah. But yeah, I really feel, I honestly feel bad for Walter because, you know, 
Knife, knife fly hit the market. That was a you know, sensation, if you want to say. But I imagine 11 tracks didn't do too well, at least as far as I know. Yeah, I, I can imagine Walter probably, you know, had some level of jealousy to an extent. You know, not, not saying that he was, you know, hateful and envious or anything, but you know, like if you were to see your friend, you know, blow up like that, I, I imagine he was probably, like, you know, kind of put down a little bit. Um, yeah. Especially like Nightfly, that 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 was nominated for several awards, including Album of the Year, and as well as Comic Curiad. That's something I kind of forget sometimes that Comic Curiad was also a, an Album of the Year nominee. Well, yeah, I mean it's I mean look, Donald is a, is a genius. I mean his solo albums are like genius, and there's something to to put against Walter. But I always kind of felt like, I mean, if you open up the CD of Eleven Tracks of Whack, and he describes what like Whack is. I think that just like in the sentence, he's saying like, "Oh, like, hey, Johnny, like, let, let your little brother take a whack at this." So, which is like funny because I think in a sense, it's almost a ja it's a self-deprecating thing as usual for Walter, a jab at himself being like Donald's little brother in the sense where it's like, okay, you know, Donald has his albums, this and you know, I Fly and Comic Curia, yeah, they're really fucking good. We put an album out, but like Eleven Tracks of Whack is kind of like, ah, like it's just a throwaway title or whatever. However he thought about it, I always felt like, you know, when you see that famous 90s photo of him and Donald and they're holding a beer and Donald has 11 tracks of whack as a shirt. Oh, I, obviously, I don't know Donald very well. I don't I don't know him at all, personally. Um, I don't, I wouldn't think that the music on 11 tracks of whack, Walter stuff, is really Donald's forte because it's so different. But I think, yeah. I think Donald really wanted to, you know, Walter's self-esteem already seems so low. He's in health confidence. I think Donald kind of doing that, wearing the shirt, helping him on the album. Of course, he loves Walter. Kind of helping him out. They're like, okay, you know, hey, man, Living Traps of Whack, go out and get it, go out and get it. Putting Book of Liars on um, Alive in America. I think that was all kind of like helping Walter's self-esteem, helping his self-esteem. Yeah, I, I thought that was really sweet, too, seeing yeah. that picture of Donald wearing the shirt and stuff, you know, just oh, like yeah. promoting his friend's stuff. Because we already know, you know, Nightfly and Comic Curie yeah, have really big success, successes. But uh, yeah, I thought that was really sweet that he had that shirt on in the picture and put Book of Liars on uh, uh, Live in America and stuff. Yeah. yeah, which is also weird in a sense because there was like Book of Liars was just released and to have like a, a track that was like just released and it gets like, you know, a spot on a live album when, when they could have put, you know, from that tour, Black Friday or Home at Last or whatever, or like you said, even a comic period song, just choosing to put Book of Liars was like, a good choice really good choice uh next ranking we'll do is probably i guess top 10 walter becker songs if you if you want because i feel like I you know do that. i want to wait for donald's new album to do the top 10 donald thing and then like rank his donald studio albums and of course walter only has and, two albums and we'll we'll riot in the streets if donald doesn't release that album this year either. yeah we'll we'll be in the streets <laughs> yeah um so but but yeah so great list um, I'll, I'll put it up on the screen here. Um, so, yeah, great. All right. Well, I will see you in another ranking. Take care. Mm -hmm. See you guys in another video. Peace out. Um,